fill out for us. This is just our Purdue poll, um, helps us with our numbers. So if you could take a few minutes while we're getting um, squared up for that, uh, we would appreciate that greatly. And then we'll get started here in a few minutes as we kind of let the weight room um, join us. Uh, just be on the lookout. Uh, we will have an end of the year uh, survey. This is similar to the one we did halfway through um, in June. Um, it's just going to ask for feedback from folks. Uh, we're curious to see, you know, uh, what you like, maybe what you didn't like, if we need to change something. Um, we do have our extension hot topics uh, for the 2024 year all filled out. Those will be Wednesdays. And I hope I said that right. Wednesdays at noon instead of Thursdays. Um, but as always, these will be recorded. We like the noon hour just because um, some folks can turn this on when they're eating their lunch. And then if they need to watch a recording, they can do so. Um, I'm going to leave the pull up for a little bit longer, but for now, uh, we'll get started with our talk. Um, again, the purpose of these hot topics is just to bring to light um, our campus specialists um, and state specialists, uh, just to let folks know where extension educators get their resources or to help extension educators um, figure out, you know, who on campus is the person, get a face to the name. Um, today's topic is very relevant. Uh, we have the spotted lantern fly. And so, Bob, I'm just going to hand it over to you and mute my microphone. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so I do recognize a lot of the names I see in the list here. So some of you have definitely been to my programs before. You have an idea of what I talk about. Um, but just to fully introduce myself, my name is Bob Bruner. I am the exotic forest pest specialist with Purdue University's Department of Entomology. Um, before that, I was myself a field extension educator. I worked in Clay and Owen counties. And throughout my career, both as an extension educator and as a specialist, I work a lot with invasive species. I've had the opportunity to research invasive species since I was an undergrad at Purdue. I studied emerald ash borer when it first arrived in our state. And since then, I moved through a bunch of different insects specifically, um, soybean aphid, uh, Asian longhorn beetle, and now the spotted lanternfly is one of our biggest ones that we are talking about right now in the state of Indiana. Now, you have probably seen a, a decent, well, I hope you've seen, if I'm doing my job right, a decent amount of information about the spotted lanternfly, whether you saw a rather infamous Saturday Night Live skit about it, or you may have noticed billboards along the road, especially if you live in the area of, say, Fort Wayne or in the northeastern parts of Indiana. Uh, the reason for this is, is that spotted lanternfly, we discovered it here in Indiana a few years back, and it has been steadily spreading. And it is a little bit problematic because it's what we refer to as a generalist herbivore. It means it can attack lots of different kinds of plants. Today, what I want to do is I just want to reiterate some of the information of just what this insect is and what it does. And then I want to explain to you what its current distribution is, because as of October, we've discovered that that distribution has now spread further from its initial infestations and it's moving throughout our state. So let's dive into this one. Now, the reason that we care about spotted lanternfly is what you're seeing in this image right here. You're seeing a, probably around 50 or so individuals attacking a grape arbor. Um, they will gather on mass, often on hot plants, where they know that they will be successful, and they will continuously feed on them. And while a lot of plants will be able to withstand the feeding and survive, um, there are several critical species that will not. And grapes, unfortunately, are one of those species. Now, to give you an idea of where spotted lanternfly kind of stands and amongst all the other insects out there, this, especially those of you who are, work around trees a lot or work in gardens a lot, you'll be able to figure out where this one's kind of related. So spotted lanternfly is in the same group of insects that also includes aphids, cicadas, stink bugs, wheel bugs, you name it, they all have one thing in common. They, their mouth parts aren't chewing. They don't grab and rip and tear on plants. What they do is they have mouth parts that act like a syringe. They will go ahead and poke those mouth parts into a plant and drain out the sap, and, and that's how they feed. Um, they're a little bit like cattle. They will stay and feed for long periods of time, then move to another spot, um, and they can do quite a bit of damage on a plant as time goes on. The other problematic thing that you'll find with spotted lanternfly is what I mentioned earlier. They have a very, very broad host range. 
um, here in Indiana, they can cover roughly about 100 plus plants. That's a very large host range for an insect that is not native to here. So where does it come from? I said it's not native. It is originally from Asia, but back in its home range, it's actually relatively uncommon. People, if you went to where it's located there and mentioned the spotted lanternfly, they may not actually know what you're talking about because if you think of some of the more rare insects here, you know, we know they're here, but how often do you see a luna moth? You could find them, but they're not super common. We believe that spotted lanternfly originally arrived on imported stone products roughly in 2012. And right now, that's just when we believe they arrived here. We haven't confirmed that. And what you're seeing here in this picture is the spotted lanternfly. You're not seeing the adult, you're not seeing the nymph, you're seeing the eggs. Those little smears of mud on that rock are spotted lanternfly egg masses that are covered with the substance to protect them by their mothers, um, and it keeps them very well hidden. Now, we originally first detected spotted lanternfly in the state of Pennsylvania in 2014. And since then, it has spread very quickly. It has covered the entire state of Pennsylvania and several of the eastern seaboard states along with it. Um, and I believe I've got a map right here for you to look at to give you an idea of what this looks like. So this map is showing the 2023 distribution of spotted lantern fly where infestations are located. So every county you see there in blue is confirmed that there has been an infestation identified. And that means that the insects are established they are reproducing, they're feeding, they're not going anywhere. You may see a few counties that have a little purple dot in them. It's a little hard to see in this picture. That means that they saw spotted lanternfly there, but there's no infestation. They just saw a few individuals. So nothing to say, hey, we need to take action yet, but they're gonna be watching those areas quite closely. Now, the next thing I'm gonna show you here is someone decided to do a little bit of data work and do a prediction of the best places where spotted lanternfly could spread as time goes on. And it goes from white being, this is a completely unsuitable area for spotted lanternfly, all the way to red where it's an extremely suitable area for spotted lanternfly. And guess where Indiana is sitting right now? We are right in the crosshair of some of the best territory that spotted lanternfly can infest because our environment closely resembles the environment they came from. Along with it, we have a surplus of the primary host of spotted lanternfly. And I'm gonna talk about that host in just a little bit. Now, the question that I do get quite a bit when people are concerned about working with this insect is, you know, the first best thing to do is to try to halt its spread. And in order to do that, you need to know how it is spreading. This picture really does kind of tell you the story though. You see just one spotted lanternfly individual sitting on the tailpipe of a car. Spotted lanternfly, they're not good at flying. They can fly around, but if you recall, think back a couple of years to when Brood X cicada came out, and you heard all of us talking about it, you probably saw some. And you probably saw them flying through the air, and you may have even seen a few bounce off the side of a house, some may have bounced off of you. Uh, they just kind of went everywhere, but they're not good at it. They can move around, and the adults are the ones that will spread the furthest, but they're not like a fly. They're not going to be super accomplished at going exactly where they want to go. So what they do is they tend to land and they tend to hold on to things and they're very good at that. Unfortunately, they're particularly good around major points of industry where there's lots of shipping, big shipping hubs, which is how they spread so easily throughout Pennsylvania with one of the major shipping hubs right there. They also hitch rides on things and they'll lay their eggs wherever they can hitch those rides. So if you have, let's say, a gravid female, a female who has a belly full of eggs, and she lands on a rail car, and she holds on and pops off that rail car wherever it stops and lays her eggs, you've, not got, you've now got spotted lanternfly spreading a lot of places that are associated with all those rail lines or major, major transit corridors like highways. The other thing is that they will also be spread by cut plants and firewood. Now, the reason for this is, and it lets me indulge a little bit here, is that when they lay their eggs, they'll do it on the sides of trees, on branches, on limbs. And this means that when you cut firewood, you could potentially be risking the spread of spotted lanternfly. So during October, I was able to use that month because it's Firewood Awareness Month to spread the message of checking your firewood for spotted lanternfly and other potential invasive insects. 
And here's just one of the many memes I made for it that I put up on Facebook and other places. Have you checked your mon for your firewood for monsters? And it helped me remind people of one of my favorite horror movies that, yes, Spotted Lanternfly is here and it is amongst our trees. So when you get firewood, please make sure you burn it where you buy it or where you cut it. Don't try to share it because right now that acts as a way of spreading Spotted Lanternfly and a host of other invasive insects as well. Now, the next best thing, too, is once we understand how it's spreading, we need to be able to tell what it is. You know, we need to make sure that we're properly identifying our insects. Now, I usually preface this by saying, if you're not sure or if you don't want to try to identify bugs, because I know not everybody's into that, you have an extension educator in every county in the state who can do so for you. And if they don't know how to do it, I guarantee you they're going to turn around and email me and I can do it. But the good thing is spotted lanternfly is pretty easy to identify. So what you're looking at here is the adult. Spotted lanternflies have what we call incomplete metamorphosis. I'm going to start from the top, though, with the adult. Um, the adults have these beige wings with black spots on them. And when they open their wings, you'll see bright red patches with black and white around it. Their bodies are black, but with yellow striping on them in between the, the plates of their armor and between the plates of their exoskeleton. Though that may not be immediately visible unless you have one that has a very full belly or has a bunch of eggs inside of it. Most people think that spotted lanternfly is actually a rather pretty insect, and I agree. Um, it's unfortunate that it's just such a problem. Now, like I said, spotted lanternfly has what's called incomplete metamorphosis. This means that they grow from an egg, they hatch out, they are a very, very small wingless version of the adult. They'll grow, you'll see wing pads developing on their back where their wings will be, and eventually they will molt into their adult shape. They do not go from caterpillar to chrysalis to adult. They skip that part. Now I'm gonna go through its life cycle real quick here in front of you. Now I'm gonna start with the eggs. So the eggs are what is present right now. In very, <clears throat> excuse me, in very, very few locations in the state, there may still be living adults even right now. These are mainly in the southern portions of the state. Now, I haven't checked on that in the last week or two, so that may have changed since then because we've had some pretty good cold snaps. They will go; they will die with the cold. The adults are annual. They will not stick around through the winter. The eggs are what will stick around. They'll lay their egg masses on the sides of trees, vehicles, houses, under eaves, underneath your car, you name it, you can find them there. And the eggs will be covered with a substance that will make them resemble a smear of mud. We refer to the egg portion of their life cycle as being cryptic because they're very hard to see. Eventually, they'll hatch out as early spring gets here into that first instar, which is what we call that time in between molts as an instar. And for the first three of them, they're going to be this little black and white polka dotted bug that will eventually grow and molt into a larger version of itself. It's bright red with black and white on it. This is how we originally figured out that spotted lanternfly was present in our state because someone in a, an invasive species group on Facebook, I believe, said, hey, what's this weird mutated ladybug? One, someone who was an expert in the field looked at this and said, hey, I know what that is, and she reported it to the DNR. Now, after you get to the fourth instar, which is right around July, they'll go ahead and molt into an adult, reproduce, feed, and eventually lay the eggs. The adults will die off, and the whole cycle will repeat itself. Now, I want to show you what that looks like in real life, too. So these are pictures that were taken by Vince Burkel of the DNR. He is a nursery spec inspector and assistant director of their division of entomology and plant pathology. He's also been at the forefront of the infestations we've had here. One of the nursery inspectors, I should say, who's been at the forefront of this. He's also great at taking pictures of these guys. So on the left side, you can see our early instar is a very, very tiny little bug. There he is sitting on a leaf. And then the late end stars, they are these bright red ones. These will probably be the ones that you see first. This is what's going to tell you spotted lanternfly is present. They're bigger. They will stand out to you very, very clearly. They're very easy to find. Um, and they will just crawl around. They will move on the ground when they move from tree to tree. They cannot fly yet. Um, and they will generally just graze on whatever plant they're attacking. And then we have our egg masses. So usually I ask a few questions about this, and on Zoom it's a little bit more challenging to do so, but how many egg masses do you think are in that picture? Take a good look for a minute and just give me an idea. And go ahead and put in the chat how many you think you see. Uh, 
Yeah, so we got a good spread in numbers right there. 50 plus. Uh, well, here's the thing. So the person who said 50 plus is actually closer to right. Um, the last time I looked at it, and keep in mind, I keep finding more of them each time I go back and count. There are over 30 of them present in this picture. Um, these spots where you see it looks like it kind of has a pebbly or an alligator skin-like surface to it, those are eggs that aren't covered properly. And you'll see they lay their eggs real close together, kind of like a stink bug or a squash bug does. And then they cover them normally with a substance that can really obscure them. Um, which is why it's so hard to find them. They're very, very good at hiding their eggs. So I'm going to give you another example here. In this picture, there are a few different egg masses, and the egg mass are right here. So it looks like just some cracked mud that's been smeared on the side of the tree. Now, when the imported stone arrived here that carried spotted lanternfly, things get inspected, and normally people will catch those. But this one, even as an experienced entomologist, I would have never thought to look for. I would not have seen it. I had to get trained properly to be able to find these when I started working with this insect. Um, now, our people in DNR, they actually go and they will scrape these egg masses off the sides of trees in an effort to control this insect. And it is, it's hard work to do. It's not fun. It's kind of gross. Um, but they do a great job in helping us out to try to control these insects by attacking these egg masses. Here's another picture of them. This one was taken out of a more recent infestation site. And the reason I like showing this picture is because if you look closely at these eggs, you can see some of them have an indentation right in the middle of them. Well, that indentation there probably indicates that that egg has hatched. So when Vince took this picture, those eggs had already hatched and he is seeing the aftermath and there's spotted lanternfly in that tree right now. Now, a little bit on their feeding habits. This, again, a picture tells a thousand words. You're seeing a very young spotted lanternfly grazing on a tree. It's got its mouth parts stuck into the tree. Their feeding is going to closely resemble other insects that use similar mouth parts. So if you see an infestation of aphids on a tree, that's going to be very similar to what spotted lanternfly is going to do. Now, they don't directly suck liquid out of a tree, they rely on the turgor pressure of the plant itself to push the liquid in their body. So they're very lazy in that regard, which is why they tend to graze rather than more actively feed. It saves them energy and it lets the tree do the work. Now, like I mentioned earlier too, they do have a very, very broad host range, but we're still learning what that host range is gonna look like. Because when they're eight here in Indiana, we have primarily found them associated only with their primary host, which is Tree of Heaven. So the plants that we are concerned about them attacking. So we know that spotted lanternfly will attack grapes. They will do severe damage to grapes, which is the concern of people who own and operate vineyards. And they can kill grapes outright. They will overinfest and kill them. American river birch is another one, as well as, as many of the maple species we have here. And in fact, research coming out of Penn State Extension has indicated that when they feed on maples that are being used for syrup production, they will reduce the quality and the yield of that process. They'll also attack black walnut, which is a tree that already has a host of other problems, including Asian longhorn beetle and thousand canker disease. And of course, their primary host, which is Tree of Heaven, another nasty invasive. Lastly, roses. Uh, I love growing roses. I'm not very good at it, but I still love it. And I'm really disappointed to learn that they will be attacking roses if they get the opportunity. And if, like I mentioned earlier, at least 100 more other plants they could potentially infest. Now, the plants that I've listed here in front of you, the reason I'm showing you these is that these are the plants that are the most sensitive to attack. Um, many trees could get potentially attacked and not suffer a whole lot of damage. They may have reduction in health, uh, fecundity, and other things, but they'll survive and they'll keep going. These plants they could overinfest and potentially kill or do severe damage to. So these are the ones that we watch out for the most. Now, the way spotted lanternfly likes to move amongst the trees it attacks is, I mentioned this earlier, they like hitting the same hot trees year after year. And this has to do with a concept known as habitat selection. So what this is, is that the spotted lanternfly hits this tree that it grew up on. So it fed on this tree when it was young. It knows that this tree is good and it can get success here. So naturally, it's going to lay its eggs. It's going to give its children the same benefit that it had. And it's going to make sure that its children can access that same hot tree because they know they can be successful. 
The nymphs tend to prefer shoots, whereas the adults prefer trunks. So that probably allows them to separate out so the adults aren't taking the same food source that the nymphs are. And they will move the furthest as adults, which makes sense. The adults are capable of flight. Now, throughout a season, their feeding choices may vary depending on how thick the population is. There's a, cab there's a reason I had that caveat in there. So what we see is that first off, they will attack grape and tree of heaven the whole time they feed. Those are their first choices, tree of heaven being their primary host in their native range. Grapes also offer the same potential benefits. Earlier in the year, we see them hitting rose and black walnut, or I should say earlier in the summer and warm seasons. And as time goes on, they'll move to ripper birch, willow, and sumac, and eventually maple later on as we get closer to fall. The way you need to imagine this is imagine that you have a lot of spotted lanternfly. They all want the same resources. So they're going to fill up those tree of heaven. They're going to fill up those grapes. And eventually, other spotted lanternfly are going to go, that's too full. I need to find somewhere else to feed. And they're going to go to the next best thing. And as time goes throughout the year, they're going to keep moving between those next best plants as they determine that there's they're going to get more food out of them based on what time of year it is. That's what this is really saying to you. Now, one of the things that I like to do in this talk is I've mentioned Tree of Heaven a few times now. A lot of folks aren't aware what Tree of Heaven is. So I want to make sure that you at least have an idea of what this plant looks like. Uh, we do have it here in Indiana. It is a very, very nasty invasive plant. Um, not everywhere in Indiana has massive infestations of it. I live in Terre Haute, and we don't yet have big infestations of Tree of Heaven, though this last year I had to pull a couple from my own property here in town, um, so I imagine it's coming. So first off, Tree of Heaven is invasive and it is widespread, particularly in areas where there isn't a whole lot of mitigation, like rail corridors, abandoned factories, um, places where people have just probably not paid enough attention to. It can also spread throughout residential areas. It can move through towns. Um, one of the towns that Spotted Lanternfly is infesting, they are stuck to the Tree of Heaven and the Tree of Heaven you'll find growing out of sidewalks, growing out of building foundations. It's really nasty. Now, the reason they attack them is that in their native range, Spotted Lanternfly and Tree of Heaven adapted to each other. One is the host for the other one. Now, they're not problematic there because they are in their native environment. They have the natural control set of that environment um, provides in terms of predators to control the tree, predators and defenses to control the bug, etc. We know that Spotted Lanternfly experiences higher reproductive success on Tree of Heaven compared to most other plants. This is research that is still ongoing, though. There may come a point where we find that they're also getting reproductive success on other plants. We are still working on researching that, and we're going to update you as soon as we find out more. It's just it is a little bit of a slow moving process because we're chained to the time of year when they're there available. Now, I want to make sure you walk away from today's program being able to identify Tree of Heaven. This is very important because if you can identify it, you'll know where Spotted Lanternfly will attack. I also want to make sure it's very clear. Spotted lanternfly has been found only mostly associated with Tree of Heaven throughout our state. There are a few moments here and there where people have picked them off of other plants, but not in a way that says they're infesting them. It's more coincidental. All the major infestations, however, are associated with Tree of Heaven. Now, Tree of Heaven has a few different names, and I want you to watch for these names because sometimes people may sell them. Um, originally, we introduced them as an ornamental plant, and some people looking to make a buck still think they can. So it may, you may hear it referred to as Chinese sumac, stink tree, stinking sumac, and a host of other names that would probably take up 10 slides to tell you. You can identify them fairly easily, though. They have a smell. Um, they have a terrible smell. I've heard people refer to it a few different ways. I've heard people refer to it as smelling like uh, rancid peanut butter. When I'm near it, to me, it smells like someone burnt butter, um, which is hard to explain. But when you walk by a plant, it will be very, very obvious. So I mentioned I pulled Tree of Heaven out of my property this year. I had saplings that were probably about six inches high. And the reason I knew they were there is I could smell them already. Like I walked by them and I, had, I literally stopped in my tracks because that smell hit me even when it was a sapling. So you will know it's there. The nastier part of Tree of Heaven, though, is that it can grow from parts and pieces. 
So if you pull the tree, you have to get all of it or else it will regrow from what remains and they can get very large after they've had a lot of time to grow. Now, some of the other ways that you can identify it too is that their leaves have a particular pattern. What you're looking at here in that bottom image is not a set of leaves, you're looking at one leaf that has individual leaflets. The leaves are compound and they're arranged alternately. So you're gonna see this leaf here with all its leaflets alternately arranged along other ones on its branch. The leaflets, as you look at them, their margin will not be serrated. They will be entire, so they will not have any serration except towards the bottom, you may notice what's referred to as glandular teeth. And you can see that in the top image there. This was taken by Lenny Farley over at Purdue University. He's our, our forester. He does a lot of great programming, especially on Tree of Heaven. If you ever get the chance to see him uh, give one, I strongly recommend it. Now those glandular, oops, gotta go eliminate that slide. Those glandular teeth will have that little gland opening on the underside of it. And that's a very, very easy way to tell that you are working with Tree of Heaven there, if the smell and the other factors haven't already tipped you off. The other thing that I like to mention too is that the bark of Tree of Heaven is a little unique to me. So its bark may resemble black walnut a little bit or a couple other trees, but honestly, like if you look at the image here on the right hand side, that funny almost ridged pattern to it really kind of stands out to me. I feel like that's a little bit unique amongst trees that I've seen. So that also makes a great way to identify it. But what I would do is to guarantee or, you know, what you're looking at, check the leaves. Those are a dead giveaway for Tree of Heaven. All right, so I filled your head with Tree of Heaven. You guys are all experts in it now. So now I want to go over why we care about this. I've gone over the bug, I've gone over the tree. Now, why do we care? How what does it do its damage? So the damage is, like I mentioned earlier, it's gonna resemble a lot of what you'd expect to see out of an aphid feeding. Um, you're gonna see spots where the plant will have wounds on it, where it'll just be tiny pen pricks, where they'll be oozing fluid. Um, you will also see that the tree may be more open to getting infections from pathogens like fungal pathogens because they've been wounded, they have spots where the pathogen can now enter. As the insect feeds, that plant is experiencing a loss of nutrients, so its ability to overwinter is being compromised. It needs that energy, that food to be able to get through our cold winters here, well, what used to be cold winters, um, and now they're losing that capacity because of the insect feeding. So what you may see on your woody plants and trees uh, that spotted lanternfly is fed on is you're going to see signs of stress. You may begin to see crown death. You may begin to notice that you're getting a lot of leaf drops off of limbs. If the plant is subjected to a significant enough disturbance, you may notice that it's not recovering very quickly. And then on a particular set of plants, like those I went over earlier with like our black walnut, our maple, our grapes, et cetera, the feeding may severely stunt the growth of the plant, or it may even outright kill the plant after enough feeding has been done. So this is also hitting over 100 different plants here in Indiana if the infestations get large enough. So this is why we're concerned. And this is why I'm here talking about this. And I've talked about this several other places throughout the state too. The other thing that we're very concerned about is much like aphids, spotted lanternfly produces a substance called honeydew. Now, for those of you who are unaware, honeydew is a substance when an insect feeds on something particularly sugary. Now, their bodies cannot process all the sugar that comes from a plant, all those starches, all that sugar that comes in, it would toxify them. So they need to excrete the excess and get it out of their body. Now, when you're looking at an aphid, they have these two little tailpipe-like structures on their back called cornicles, and they'll exude honeydew out. That's the sugar being pushed out of their body. It is a waste product. Spotted lanternfly will do the same thing and it will fire, well, honestly, it'll fire the honeydew out of its abdomen uh, where it disposes of the rest of its waste and it will produce a lot. Um, you can actually see that they push it out with enough force that it kind of shoots out of their body and it will come down like rain if the infestation is large enough. You can actually look up YouTube videos of what this looks like. I am not even exaggerating that. Unfortunately, when honeydew hits the ground, it creates this great substrate for sooty mold to be able to develop. Now, sooty mold doesn't directly attack a plant. It's going for the sugary substrate that it's currently covering. But what it will do is if we look at this hosta down here that I showed you a second ago, that's a lot of photosynthetic area that hosta has now lost access to. 
So this is not a good situation for understory plants, especially if you're looking at like ornamentals you have planted around, in and around the area of a tree that has an infestation. Now the infestations themselves. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about the two we've had for a couple of years now. What you're looking at here is a map of downtown Huntington, very close to a railroad track. And what you can see there is that each of those little orangish red dots that you see, that indicates where DNR found an active infestation of spotted lanternfly on a tree of heaven. So keep that in mind, that is on tree of heaven. Um, this is throughout residential areas. And what you see where it kind of makes that loop towards the bottom, uh, that is an old abandoned factory area. Now the trains move through there at a very fast rate. So it's unlikely that the spotted lanternfly got there via train car, um, which is what I would normally guess. It's most likely that someone may have made a trip out to Pennsylvania or something and then unwittingly brought the bug back with them. There's already an infestation of Tree of Heaven. So the spotted lanternfly got together with it and the infestation spread since then. Um, DNR has worked very hard in that area to try to contain it. They're doing trapping and other efforts. What compounds the difficulty of it, too, is that, like I said, this is a residential area, which means they need to go to every property and ask permission from the landowner to be able to go on there and try to do work on this. And thankfully, they've done a great job getting it done. Um, I've actually had the opportunity to fly drones over that area to help out some of the researchers at Purdue to map out what it looks like, how is the Tree of Heaven responding to the infestations it's experiencing. Hey, Bob, uh, I got to go out to that site, too, because it's about mm -hmm. five minutes from where I live. And um, just getting on your hands and knees, we were uh, kind of I, I agree with you. Those egg masses are so hard to find. And it's almost like hunting for morel mushrooms. You got to find one and then you start to see them. And then we actually uh, took um flimsy um, putty knives and mm -hmm. then you would scrape them down and then scoop them up. It was gross, but kind of satisfying. Um. But yeah, they do a good job of recording. I was amazed at how much uh, reporting that they do for each egg mass. It was very, very precise with that. So I just wanted to and, throw that in. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And please do. Um, I think I've got included a little bit later here. I think I talked about how many. I think DNR was able to get somewhere in the neighborhood of 17,000 egg masses scraped off of trees in this last year. So keep in mind, there are eight nursery inspectors for DNR throughout the entire state, and they did that many egg masses scraped off of the side of a tree. So that's just incredible to me. Um, so I see a question in the chat besides reporting sightings. Is there anything else we need to do or you'd want us to do? I'm actually going to cover that in just a little bit. So hold on to that question. Um, so I'm going to go to the next infestation that's been here a couple of years now. This one is in Switzerland County, further south. Now what this is, is we know how this started. Someone bought property and moved from Pennsylvania to that area. Unfortunately, there was an infestation of tree of heaven already present, so the bugs came with that person, and they spread throughout a very rural area that's a little bit of a hike to try to control these. Now, since then, this, these two infestations have been present for about two years now, I believe. These are new ones, though. Now, this is a lovely picture. This is near Mishawaka in, I believe, Elkhart, um, just not right where the county line is, and it's alongside a railroad track. However, this picture has a big problem. All those love, love, that lovely greenery right there is Tree of Heaven. And we have since found spotted lanternfly in Elkhart County, St. Joe County. We've also now found it in Porter County, as well as in Fort Wayne in Allen County. So we've gone from having two counties with an infestation to six. And these images were taken, again, by Vince Burkle and other DNR nursery inspectors. Um, and this really does tell the whole story that, you know, this is our immature insect that they found. So that means that, yeah, eggs were laid in that area because we have immature insects present. Um, we've got adults that were massing together on Tree of Heaven, and they were in other locations, too. So, for example, I believe this is winter creeper that they're currently occupying. Again, they are they have other plants that they can feed from and expect to be able to derive food out of them. Now, getting to the management aspect of this, oh, before I move to the management aspect, there's something else I wanted to mention. So let's go back to our nice picture of the train here. This is a picture that was taken by Eric Bittinger, who's the nursery inspector up in that area. Um, Fort Wayne is one of those locations where we've now found spotted lanternfly. Fort Wayne is also a major shipping hub for the state of Indiana that connects not only to the northern part of the state, but it has lines that reach down into places like Lafayette. 
So that means that what I would expect to see as we get into the next growing season is that spotted lanternfly may hitch a ride and begin infesting the Lafayette area, which is yet another shipping hub for our state. So we're looking at now we're under the gun, so to speak, for a big critical mass moment of this to be able to spread. It keeps me working, but unfortunately, it's not a great thing. So management, what can we do? What is being done? So first off, in terms of chemical treatment, I'm going to preface this by saying uh, don't do chemical treatment yet. DNR is trying to handle that as best they can as they go. I want you to report it to DNR. Uh, once we hit that critical mass moment, it'll probably be, that'll be the point where you need to start working on it yourself if you have an infestation on your property, but we're not there yet. Now, in terms of chemical treatments that are effective, primarily we see that systemic insecticides work very well for spotted lanternfly. And they, you can use them in the form of sprays, injections, soil drenches, you name it. They do seem to respond to it pretty well. The biggest issues that we see with it is that infestations tend to get repeated uh, each, uh, each time you clear them out, more just come back, unfortunately. And then you also have the mass of dead spotted lantern fly on the ground after you've done so to get rid of. Now, we've noticed that a systemic insecticide called dinotefrin seems to work fairly well. And according to uh, Vince Burkle at DNR, they found that basal bark treatments of it seem to be fair, the most effective way of applying it. Now, a lot of people would be concerned about using a systemic insecticide because they're concerned that it's going to interfere with pollination activities. Well, the good thing is, is that Tree of Heaven isn't a super pollinator visited plant. It does have some, um, but you can work with your timing of when you do applications and you can just avoid being around plants that pollinators are going to be more interested in. And you can actually avoid a significant portion of the damage and all of the people who are doing these applications are very well trained on how to do that. And if you're curious about how that works, I would uh, strongly recommend talk to your local extension educator. They are quite literally trained to be able to help you answer questions on that. Um, we also noticed, now this is getting to what Jeff was just talking about. There are a few different things you can do other than just putting pesticide on it. So egg scraping is a tactic that we do during the winter. So you could basically start it in November and go all the way through when they hatch out in April. And what this is, is you are taking something like, I believe, Jeff, you've mentioned using a flimsy putty knife. I've seen credit cards. I actually have um, things that look like credit cards that I give out that just have little soft spotted lantern fly. If you ever see me at an event, I can give you one. And what you do is you go up to the egg mass, you put it against the egg mass, and you push down on it to pop the eggs to destroy them. It is not pleasant work. And then you scrape it into something like a bag or a bucket with soapy water or maybe some diluted alcohol to make sure the eggs are dead. Um, that is what DNR was doing throughout the last winter. And I imagine they're doing it right now, too, to try to eliminate those eggs. Um, now, once you have done that, once you have put them in alcohol or soapy water and you're sure that they are dead, you should be able to safely compost, well, not compost, I'm sorry, you should be able to safely dispose of them in plastic bags. Um, that one, I still want to get double checked because that one's kind of evolving as time goes on. But once you've destroyed the eggs, they should be dead. Um, the other thing you can do, too, is if you don't want to scrape the eggs, we've also found that horticultural sprays and oils tend to work, particularly soybean oil, by spraying it onto the egg masses that will cut off their oxygen and it will kill them. Now, some recommendations from Penn State Extension say to use sticky traps. I do not recommend using a sticky trap to try to control spotted lanternfly or any other insect. Um, those are good for monitoring and very particular activities such as mating disruption that we use with other insects. Otherwise, sticky traps run too high a risk of capturing things that you don't want to get in a sticky trap. Um, so I would use those to monitor, but really, even with spotted lanternfly, I just, I personally don't recommend that. Um, contact insecticides are effective on the uh, nymphs before they become adults, they're going to be more susceptible to that. And then after that, once adults start appearing, you can go ahead and moving on to trunk sprays, injections, et cetera, to try to control them. There's also a few biocontrol options that are being currently researched. So uh, some of those I've actually had experience working with before in the form of entomopathogenic fungi, 
what this is is it is a fungus that will specifically attack insects. Now you probably heard of the uh, zombie fungus that will attack ants. Uh, this is not quite like that. This is just a fungus that will attack these bugs and kill them. They're not going to turn them into a zombie. They'll just infest them and kill them. Um, these are called Bacto uh, Bacoa major and Bavaria bassiana. Uh, right now, they're being researched for commercial purposes, and there are some definitely good results we're seeing so far. So hopefully we'll be able to use that. And the good thing, too, is that they are native. They are already here, so we're not going to be introducing something new to our environment. Um, oh, the other thing I should mention, too, is that on the top here, I neglected this one, is that there are some parasitoids that will also attack spotted lanternfly in their home range. That is a wasp that will go ahead and inject their eggs in the inside of their body. They will hatch and the larva will consume the bug from the inside out. Um, now, they work great in their native environment, but we're having a lot of trouble rearing them over here. So releasing those, I'm not sure that's going to happen anytime soon but hopefully we'll be able to get something out of that. So the other question that I saw is what can we do? Uh, first off, get rid of your tree of heaven. These are the things that spotted lanternfly are infesting first. They preferentially go to it, remove them as best you can. The less tree of heaven, the better chance you have of an infestation not occurring. The other thing to do is to report it. So you can report it using EdMaps or Gleden, the Great Lakes Early Detection Network, um, you can make accounts on EdMaps to be able to report where you saw the insect. You're going to want information as where you saw it, maybe pictures, and just about everything you can include in that. You can also call 1-866-NO-EXOTIC. That is the hotline directly to DNR, where you can go ahead and say, hey, I saw a bug right here. When you do so, uh, what we're asking is that you write down where you were, take a picture of what you saw, and maybe collect a sample, you can always send it in to the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Laboratory, and we will identify it. I guarantee you, if they don't, they'll call me and have me do it. And just to help educate the people around you. And when it comes to reporting, folks, I don't care if you saw a dog that was dressed like a spotted lanternfly, report it. Let's not take any chances on this. A spotted lanternfly does have a few lookalikes. I would rather get some lookalikes than not get a potential infestation. Now, if you're looking for more resources, you can always email me. I have my email in front of you right now. You can also look at us on our different social media, as well as look up the Purdue Landscape Report, which you can subscribe to for free and just get regular reports on invasives and a whole bunch of other things going on with our state and how we work with our plants and other uh, insects. I also run the Emerald Ashbor University with Michigan State University and Ohio State where we do informative webinars that talk about the more nitty gritty stuff when it comes to managing invasives. And Penn State Extension as well makes an excellent resource for a lot of this information. All right, with that, that is all I have for you folks. And I'd be more than happy to answer questions. Looks like we had one just show up in the chat box. Um, is there a plant or any type of pre-treatment that repels spotted lanternfly? None that we know of. Um, they're a little too opportunistic. I. I really doubt that we're going to find something that's going to be a repellent to them. Um, the main thing is, is we are just trying to watch what they will go to more than anything else. Because even though there are a hundred different kinds of plants that they'll attack in the state, they really prefer a tree of heaven. And they'll go to that first off no matter what. But as for repellent, unfortunately, we've just not found anything. Uh, one thing I noticed, um, they're really hardy. Like, I would almost say, like, if you were to step on one, they almost have a bit of a crunch to them. Uh, and I guess one thing, are there, uh, like, what you had mentioned similar species. Could you name a few of those just to kind of get on people's minds? So the thing that like spotted lanternfly with its body shape really reminds me of, and you can kind of see it in that picture in front of you right now, that's the same body shape a cicada has. Um, and they're formed very, very much like a cicada. So that's the first thing that I think of when I see them. And yeah, cicadas tend to be pretty armored. Like if you step on one, they do have a good crunch to them. Um, gross, I know. But what you will also notice is that they will be much smaller than a cicada. So I see someone asking, are they similar size? They will actually be smaller. They'll be much smaller, probably about half the size of your average cicada we see here in Indiana. Uh, one thing I was gonna ask too, uh, especially with the Huntington location, um, are they c coming up with more tools developments for like hand scraping and different things? Because I think back when I was helping with it, yeah, we're using putty knives, but in terms of technology, are they 
Uh, is the market trying to kind of keep up with that or anything new coming down the pipeline to help people, you know, if they have a tree and they see it, they can actually help get that since pesticides are really not on the table right now. So right now, um, what I've been noticing is two things. So there is a gentleman who works for the USDA who has designed a trap for spotted lanternfly that you'll see posted throughout Huntington and other areas. It's called a lampshade trap. Um, and there is actually, if you go to the Emerald Ashford University on YouTube, it is a channel. Um, one of the videos that got posted on there is a this gentleman talking about how to make that trap, what it does, and how effective it is. Now, I wouldn't expect that to control a, an infestation, but it will help you monitor a lot, and it will help somewhat in control. The other thing, too, that's up and coming is some of the research that I've been helping out with where we're trying to use UAV technology to track where it is and the impact it has on a landscape. Um, these things are still relatively in their infancy, so we need more time to develop it as it goes because we, we've we only been able to really implement major control measures only within the last couple of years. At, at least in our state, it's even been less time than that. Now, we're watching places like Pennsylvania who've had to deal with this longer to see what they're working with. But if you look at what they're doing right now, there's a lot of messaging on it and a lot of monitoring. But control efforts, again, we're still we're still working on learning more and what's going to work. Excellent. Well, if there's uh, any more questions, feel free to throw those in the chat box um, as we kind of wrap up here. Um, we will be sending out, like we said, the email. Um, that uh, we'll have sort of the resources and then a couple follow-up um, surveys. We did have another question come in uh, mentioning the tree of heaven. Um, let's see how oh, my computer's acting up here. Get out so there. I can see it. I can see okay. what he's saying. So he's asking, do infestations occur along the length of the trunk or do they tend to be concentrated at lower levels? Now, egg masses do have a tendency to be higher on the tree's surface, but not always. Sometimes you'll find them lower. Um, when I have seen living insects, uh, you can pretty readily find nymphs along the uh, leaves, along the branches. They may be crawling on the ground as they move between trees. You'll be able to find those pretty well. The adults will probably be a little bit higher and more concentrated on the trunks themselves. Um, but the, the big thing is if you're looking to see if they're present, you'll see the nymphs, they will stand out and you'll be able to identify them. Excellent. So, um, well, then thank you, Bob, for, uh, joining us today. You know, this was kind of one of those hot topics that, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to have this sort of program, um, and if you're okay with it, we have the recording, we'll put mm -hmm. that up with your information so that it's just kind of on our, um, record this is this is our 13th hot topic so um we're going to continue on to season three uh starting in january and we had a this was a good presentation to kind of leave off for the uh, holiday season and um yeah i guess the big thing we'll just as educators we'll try to make sure we get our outreach out there because there are quite a few resources that can help um people recognize those so um with that um Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I will stop the recording and you guys all have a great day. All right. Have a good set of holidays.